So I know you all come from different backgrounds, and um, uh, I'm going to spend the next hour and a half with you uh, giving a preface to, to HIV, and then you'll be coming back to that as you <clears throat> get into more detail about point of care uh, uh, testing, um, which is the theme of this, um, of this meeting. Um, what I'd like to do is, uh, is <coughs> give a brief overview um, of some epidemio pathogenesis epidemiology uh, to put HIV in context, um, and then we'll look at some other uh, issues around uh, screening, um, of which counseling is a part of that, uh, the identification of HIV infection, and then look at some principles of primary care and lab monitoring of HIV um, infected patients um, with the flavor to, to the laboratory uh, specialist. Now, I've summarized the basics in this slide. There will be slides in your, in your slide set that I don't cover um, for reasons of time, but you, they're there for your reference and you can read them at your leisure. So as ma many of you know, um, HIV is a retrovirus, uh, and it's characterized by having a reverse transcriptase, which is viral specific. We don't encode that enzyme. And the other viruses that um, have a similar um, biology are the, is HIV-2, which is primarily in, in West Africa, but is here in the United States. And in fact, um, in the last year or so, 1% uh, of our new infections were HIV-2. Uh, and then there are the, the um, primate uh, lymphotropic viruses uh, and the human lymphotropic virus, uh, HTLV-1 and 2, 3 and 4, that, all, that infect man as well. The other virus that has reverse transcriptase that we're not talking about but may come across in your point of care testing is uh, hepatitis B virus. So these viruses came um, into the human population from chimpanzees uh, and primates. Um, and uh, recently, actually, there was an isolated virus from gorillas that got into humans. And these, these uh, trans-species infections have been going on for a long time, but really flamed into, into a raging inferno uh, in the last uh, uh, 30 or so years, but has been in human population for probably around 100 years. And this is a characteristic of viruses that, that cross species, is they, they may not have produced much disease in the in the source species, but they certainly do into man when they're introduced for the first time. And from a biological point of view, we've been very privileged to, to see this transition and be able to study it because the, um, the uh, investigation into the interaction between this virus and related viruses and the human host has shed an enormous amount of light on the biology of, of um, viral infections in man. Now this, as you know, is a worldwide pandemic and there are over 33 million people currently um, living with HIV infection <coughs> and there are about 2 million deaths per year. In North America, uh, in the United States in particular, this is a major epidemic uh, in the black American population and we'll talk about that uh, in a short while. Transmission is via blood, um, body fluids, sex, injection, drug use, mother to child transmission, rarely now by blood transfusions because of screening um, of blood products by nucleic acid um, uh, methods. Um, the virus it destroys a, a, the key conductor of the immune system, the CD4 cell, and this results in immunosuppression. And it's immunosuppression or immunodeficiency um, brought on by HIV infection that results in the morbidity and mortality associated with the disease. From a diagnostic point of view, in a capsular summary, uh, we rely on serologic um, diagnostics involving um, enzyme immunoassay-based uh, assays um, or chemiluminescent assays uh, with confirmation by Western blot. And there are various ways of approaching that confirmation algorithm. As, you, as, as many of you know, coming from parts of the world that use um, point of care or simple rapid diagnostic testing, these, can be, these are used in, in, in combination to establish infection. Here in the United States, uh, we require uh, confirmatory testing by Western blot or immunofluorescent um, antigen detection. Um, and we also distinguish HIV-1 from HIV-2 infection, although that's not universally done in all parts of um, the United States. We also can de detect the viral genome and quantify it um, and this is a cornerstone of clinical management uh, using 
polymerase chain reaction amplification. Um, there are other things that we can do. We can detect antigen. And as you know, uh, the Abbott assay, um, their fourth generation EIA antigen assay was just FDA approved la uh, last week in the United States, although it's been in wide use uh, throughout the rest of the world for well over a decade. You'll find out that from a diagnostic point of view, we're very slow here in the, in the United States because of all the regulations around <coughs> uh, licensure of these various kits and assays, and that impacts on point of care testing as well. We can grow the virus. That's only for research purpose now, although we used to do that routinely in our clinical trials. And then we monitor disease, and really there are two major parameters to monitor. One is the level of virus, and are we suppressing the virus on uh, the appropriate antiretroviral therapy? And the second is, is there immune response to the suppression of the virus? And we look at the CD4 count. Now, the CD4 count doesn't uh, directly measure function, but indirectly it does. And we know that the higher the CD4 count, uh, the better off you are, because the consequences of <coughs> um, unfettered disease are immuno is immunosuppression and, and the result in opportunistic infections and malignancies that arise uh, from that. And we're able to reverse that with, uh, by suppressing the virus. So the level of virus then has prognostic um, uh, information for us, which we'll come back to. There's no vaccine. There's no cure. Um, we use antiretroviral drugs to suppress uh, inf infection, and we'll briefly talk on that later. Um, we also offer prophylaxis if you get exposed uh, in occupationally um, uh, from a needle stick or contact with infected biologic material, uh, and that's very effective. There's also um, post-exposure prophylaxis for um, other non-occupational exposures as well, although uh, a proof is, is at the moment um, lacking, but it's uh, widely available. So let's look at some issues of uh, ba basic pathophysiology. It's important to remember that this virus is a lifelong infection. Um, it's characterized by viral replication, and, and uh, the disease manifestations are, <coughs> are, are um, ones based on immune pathogenesis. So as I mentioned, the virus infects the CD4 cells. Um, this is the conductor of the immune system in macrophages. It integrates into the genome of the infected cell, and therefore as long as the cell is alive, um, the virus is present. <coughs> so we look at this as a lifelong chronic infection. Um, there's very high rates of viral replication uh, and recombination that go on, um, and the infidelity of the reverse transcriptase results in uh, base changes that results in a lot of variation in production of a quasi-species of virus uh, in, in a given host over time. So the virus evolves and consequently um, responds um, to, to the selective pressure of antiretroviral therapy. So the development of drug resistance uh, I is a clinical um, issue that, that um, we need to deal with. We also know that immune activation favors viral replication, and so anything that stimulates the immune system is, is bad for you, it's good for the virus. And there's more knowledge being obtained about how uh, the virus immune system and this immune activation um, how, this in, how these uh, three factors interact, but uh, uh, you can see that a part of, of routine um, um, health um, maintenance in individuals is to prevent immune activation. That means fighting infections, doing, using immunizations, uh, trying to avoid situations where there's immune activation. There's clearly a vigorous immune response to the virus, but it doesn't clear it. And unlike any other virus infection that I'm aware of, um, the retrovirus group uh, there are no cases of spontaneous uh, viral clearance or cure, although there is one supposed medical cure following a bone marrow transplant, but that's, that's an aberration. Um, untreated uh, chronic infection results in progressive immunodeficiency, as I mentioned, and without treatment, uh, death um, from opportunistic infections and malignancies. So very early in infection, <coughs> um, the, an infected cell reservoir is established, uh, this probably happens within the first several days of infection. And it's been uh, appreciated in the last few years that the gastrointestinal tract is an extremely important target uh, and is depleted of CD4 cells very early in the, f in the infection. An infected cell may uh, produce virus and die, either directly from viral replication or be targeted by um, CD8 cells, uh, or cytotoxic lymphocytes, and destroyed. 
or the, the, vir the cell may turn into a memory cell and be quiescent for many years and maintain the reservoir latently um, when these cells uh, uh, recognize their, their particular antigens and are activated, the virus will replicate. So the CD4 cell is, is uh, the, the key target um, and it orchestrates all other components. So when the CD4 numbers are depleted, uh, from the normal range, there's, there's um, uh, uh, immune deficiency results and the consequences of that. So uh, a very important cell in that the CD4 cell is one of the, is the key uh, markers we follow clinically, as you know. So when we look at the course of infection then, uh, following uh, acute infection, there's, there's a ra rapid period of viral replication which is determined in the plasma by the detection of, of, of core antigen of the virus called P24 or viral RNA. There's a decline in the CD4 cells and then after about three months um, the viral level settles to either a very low level which reflects immune containment and very low levels of RNA um, or low set point uh, and generally we consider a low set point being under probably under uh, 5,000 copies of RNA per milliplasma is associated with slow disease progression. Other individuals don't contain the virus and have very high levels um, uh, in excess of uh, 10 to 30,000 copies per mil and or higher and uh, they, they progress more rapidly. And progression uh, clinically is noted by more, more rapid fall in the CD4 count. For the most part, um, if you take 100 people who become infected and, are untre and uh, don't receive treatment, um, the, half of that population of individuals will have progressed by 10 years, the other half will have not progressed uh, and have contained the infection. Eventually, however, there's sufficient immune suppression that, uh, that the host is not able to uh, control in, uh, replication and viral levels go up, CD4 count drops, there may be evolution of the virus um, and change in its chemokine receptor from the CCR5 to CXR4 um, um, virus. Uh, and, and progression to death. What we generally see is that therapy um, uh, aborts or uh, blocks in infection, de decreases it such that there's recovery of the immune system and <coughs> um, patients are maintained in a healthier state. The magic uh, CD4 number uh, for defining AIDS is 200. Now normally you're up in the high hundreds, 800,000 range. When you reach 200, even if you're otherwise healthy, by definition, that's an AIDS-defining illness uh, condition at that point because the CD4 cell count is so low. And your risk without prophylaxis in the United States for um, pneumocystis pneumonia is about one in, uh, one in five, of 20% per year. Now, how do we put all this together? In the simplest terms, uh, we can look at, at HIV um, uh, as a speeding train. The speed of the train is the, is the, uh, the level of viral replication, high, high viral, viral levels associated with a fast train, slow viral levels with the slow train. And the length of time to the CD4-200 precipice is the length of the track. So the point of therapy then is to slow the train down, if not reverse it, and uh, increase the time, uh, the distance between the train and the end of this uh, precipice at 200 CD4 cells. And that's basically what we're trying to do clinically, um, and, and we're able to do that quite successfully. So if we summarize the relationship between um, years of infection and use the CD4 cells as a marker, we see that uh, patients present after several years um, with some um, uh, increased evidence of immune suppression, albeit subtle, in the way of outpatient infections like varicella zoster or shingles, uh, recurrent and mucocutaneous herpes, abnormally prolonged candida infection at mucosal membranes, for example, vagin uh, candid va uh, vaginal candidiasis, uh, and susceptibility to bacterial pneumonias. Generally occurring at around the time we start to see plasma viremia, uh, from an infectious plasma viremia detected, which indicates in rising um, RNA levels. Without treatment, the CD4 count declines to 200 and below, at which time we have an AIDS-defining condition. As I mentioned, at 200 CD4 cells, um, the um, uh, risk of PCP uh, uh, or pneumocystis pneumonia is approximately 20% per year, and for which we prophylax with trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. As the CD4 count continues to drop, we see reactivation of toxo, 
um, atypical mycobacteria here in the United States, elsewhere in the world, um, TB and, and cryptococcal um, uh, infection, and CMV, retinitis, and colitis, and other things. So what therapy is able to do um, in people who have advanced disease is, is stop viral replication and, and allows for some partial reconstitution of the uh, CD4 count above 200. And with a sustained CD4 count of over 200 on therapy uh, for more than three months, we're actually able to stop some of these um, primary prophylaxis um, medications. And that that's, that's a, a, a attests to the increased integrity of the immune system. And in a nutshell, that's sort of the, the essential pathogenesis of the disease uh, and how it fits into therapy. And we'll come back as we talk about monitoring later. So let's look at the epidemiology. Uh, from a global perspective and from the United States. <coughs> this is 30 year, almost 30 years now um, since the first cases of HIV were described. That's actually in June 1981 is when I graduated from medical school. So it, it's been around um, for all of my career uh, to date in medicine and um, has been a scourge that uh, has brought us all together in this room in part, although I know the interests um, for the course are beyond HIV and on STDs in general. But HIV clearly plays, uh, has played an important and galvanizing role um, in the, global, in the uh, globalization of, of sexually transmitted infections as we know them. Initially, it was described in Men Who Have Sex With Men, but we know that this uh, is not uh, a disease exclusively of that group, <coughs> but involves all people, men, women, and children, um, homosexual and heterosexual. And in fact, one of the first major advances in HIV um, therapy was the ability to block or decrease maternal uh, child transmission by, <coughs> by anti using antiviral therapies in the mother prior to delivery in the child at the time and uh, post-delivery. So the face of AIDS has changed. Uh, it's taken a long time to, for that to be appreciated. Now these are data from three years ago, but they're much the same now. <coughs> uh, so I haven't updated the figures because they haven't really changed. As I mentioned, we have over 33 million people living with HIV. There are about two and a half million uh, new infections per year. And uh, HIV still brings out um, about um, uh, two million or so uh, deaths per year. Globally, as indicated here, and you're all familiar with this, the major burden is in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, uh, and, and this is the area of, of greatest um, of focus. In, in North America, we have over a million uh, cases. Um, Caribbean is heavily hit, um, uh, and so is South America, Asia, um, et cetera. The major focus is in sub-Saharan Africa. In the United States, we still, despite the fact that, that most people who should be on treatment um, are on treatment, um, there are still uh, around uh, 50 to 60,000 new infections per year. Uh, these are the latest um, uh, statistics on that. <coughs> the confidence intervals um, are anywhere from about 50 to 65,000 cases, and which is very interesting that we haven't seen a, a, a real decline in the number of new um, uh, incident infections per year in a country that, that devotes resources and is able to um, uh, provide treatment for most, but not all, individuals. And one reason for that is the infectiousness of individuals over the course of infection changes with evidence that very early in infection there is more transmission than later in infection when there's an immune response uh, and partial containment of virus, and then late in the disease uh, with the immune deficiency uh, virus levels rise again. So. Um, it's been um, modeled that maybe up to half of new infections occur during the uh, eight weeks or so following <coughs> primary infection or in that period of time uh, in the first several months when um, viral levels are high and the individual may not know they're infected. And there's a lot of interest from a public health perspective of trying to identify these individuals and see if we can intervene effectively um, and decrease uh, transmission. The role of antiviral therapy and decreasing the viral shedding of viruses is, is, um, uh, is, is quite strong and compelling, and we will see over time how antiviral therapy is used to treat, uh, to block transmission. And there's, there's several big studies going on worldwide 
to look at that at, at this point in time. But again, their virus th vi uh, antiviral therapy is directed at decreasing the shedding of virus in the general tract. Um, the deaths, uh, as I mentioned, around 2 million per year um, uh, globally. Um, and children under 15, um, there are about 2.5 million uh, uh, children uh, living with HIV. Again, the major burden is in sub-Saharan Africa. On a daily basis, just under 7,000 new infections per day. Uh, the majority of these, uh, the vast majority, almost all, are in low and middle income countries. Um, and uh, uh, about half um, of these new infections are among women. And 40% uh, are among adolescents, uh, individuals. Globally, when we look at, at uh, prevalences, we can see the United States ranks uh, <coughs> fourth uh, with an overall adult prevalence of about 0.6%. Um, and that's an interesting statistic, at least from my perspective, uh, given um, all the other countries um, that, that the United States still ranks uh, fourth. So um, a long way to go um, to bring down the, um, <coughs> the adult prevalence. And to illustrate that, um, uh, a year or so ago, <coughs> um, the, 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 the first highlights came out indicating that in, in um, our nation's capital, the um, infection rate was about 3% of over 12-year-olds. Um, and uh, this is a, a hallmark of the infection I'm going to come back and talk about among black Americans. <coughs> um, this rate is as high as it is in many um, African countries. Pretty, pretty um, despicable. I'll also point out that was on a BBC web page. <laughs> it wasn't uh, widely passed around. It actually occurred during a mayoral race in Washington, D.C. and didn't turn out to be a topic of discussion amongst the individuals running for office. Too bad. So um, when we look at, at uh, HIV infection um, among men and women, uh, globally we can see that in sub-Saharan Africa over 60 percent of the in, uh, uh, individuals living with HIV are women. Um, and uh, the rates are rising in other parts of the world. Uh, notice the Caribbean, where it's uh, over 40 percent. The United States is around uh, 30 percent um, at the moment. But uh, globally, uh, the burden falls among, among women. In the United States, um, these data f from 1985 up to 2005 show that the uh, proportion of AIDS cases among women is, is just under 30 <coughs> percent. It's around 28 to 30 percent. Um, and it's plateaued. Among uh, Caucasians, uh, the rates have been dropping, um, uh, but it's been going up among blacks, so that now in the United States, half the cases um, are among the black population, um, and about a third among the white population. When we look at the proportion of AIDS cases by population, uh, uh, race, and ethnicity, um, and these are 33 of the 50 states that are, report, that are reporting in this particular CDC surveillance program, but 70% of, the of, the, of our population is, is white, and they count for about a third of the cases of HIV AIDS. 13% of the population is black, and they account for about 50% of the cases, again, showing the, the racial um, disparity uh, in this country. Uh, when we look at uh, adults and adolescents, um, and the uh, uh, transmission category, uh, we can see that among women, 80% um, uh, of the transmissions occur through high-risk heterosexual contact, while among men, um, two-thirds of the cases are among uh, men who have sex with men. Uh, and among women, uh, injection drug use is about 20%. So heterosexual transmission is, is the major transmission route among uh, women, and as I'll show, the majority of these women are black, and, <coughs> um, and uh, the majority of them don't know the risk factors of their male partners. In fact, when we look at HIV infection in the United States, um, women, this is data from 2005, accounted for 27 percent of AIDS cases. Among black women, um, they accounted for 66 percent of the cases. Uh, with an overall uh, infection rate of 46 cases per 100,000. And that's 23 times the rate among white women, where it's about 2 per 100,000, Hispanics 11 per 100,000, 
and um, uh, uh, and the other groups shown here. So a, a huge um, a disparity between um, between the black and white population. Uh, most women, um, that 71 percent with AIDS, are diagnosed between ages of 25 and 44, and teenage girls represent 43 percent of the cases reported uh, among uh, the adolescent group between ages of 13 and 19. Uh, young women in the age group of 2024 20, represent about 28 percent of the cases in this age group, and women age 25 years and older represent about 26 percent of the cases in, in, the, in uh, their age group. So when we look at, uh, at women uh, in the United States, 72 percent of the population are white. They account for 17 percent of the AIDS cases, 13 percent of the pop population are black females, uh, and they account for two-thirds of the cases. Uh, so again, a huge disparity among, um, um, among women in particular. Um, now these are data th uh, that, that are show the relationship between age group, either uh, less than 39 or over 39, and the uh, um, uh, percent of HIV infection. And if we focus on the, on the blue bars, we can see that the infection rate among, among blacks uh, under the age of uh, 39 is, a, is about one and a half percent. And for those over the age of, of 40, it's about three and a half percent, with the upper confidence interval going up to almost seven percent. And this is reflected in the data that I, I briefly summarized from Washington, D.C., where the, <coughs> the population is predominantly black, and the infection rate in the city um, for everyone over the age of 12 is three percent. Uh, but among black men, it's probably up to close to 7 percent. When we look at um, other data with regard to sexually transmitted infections and focus on genital herpes um, in the different population groups, we can see a couple of trends. Um, ob one, obviously, the high percentage of, of black individuals who are herpes infected. Um, and then over these uh, three epochs, um, based on Haynes' uh, surveillance data, we can see that um, overall there's been a decline in herpes, um, um, probably due to the, to the discussion around safe sexual practices. And it's most pronounced in the white population, but also in the, in the Mexican-American population. But there have been no significant changes among the black population in herpes transmission. And the reason I bring up herpes is because where goes herpes goes HIV. Um, for obvious reasons, um, they're, they're linked uh, as sexually transmitted infections, and we know that herpes um, probably facilitates acquisition of HIV because um, the virus um, um, in part destroys an, a normal epithelial barrier to HIV infection. Um, so in the context of STIs, <coughs> HIV is simply another, and the overall control of HIV will probably be very dependent on the control of STIs. And we know we have several STIs that we can actually cure, but we don't. We can't which argues we're never going to cure HIV. If we can't cure gonorrhea, syphilis, and other things that are treatable, totally eradicated from an individual, but not the population, what is the chance of eradicating HIV? No way, Jose. Now another issue that I find of interest is that women are more likely to be tested for HIV than men. And these are data uh, recently published showing this uh, phenomenon. Um, and, and there are probably obvious reasons for that. I mean, why would women be more interested in being tested for HIV? Hmm? They've got children. They've got families, you know. They're more attached to the families than the men are. <laughs> and that's just a, a phenomenon. Uh, and of course, uh, the majority of women uh, uh, queried here would have been black as well, and, and it's a matriarchal um, group where 80% where, uh, uh, of the heads of the households in the black population are women. Another interesting phenomenon, though, is in geriatric HIV. And uh, this reference here is to a New England Journal case study recently published with a 70-odd-year-old man turning up with a perplexing uh, illness, and eventually someone thought of testing him for HIV, and sure enough, that's why he, he what he had. And um, I don't make light of this because in my clinic, the median age is uh, 46 in my clinic. Um, and we're seeing an aging population of individuals with HIV. So uh, if you are uh, looking after um, 
um, people um, in a clinical setting, uh, HIV testing needs to be offered to all, not just people you perceive to be young and sexually active. Um, older people are sexually active and <coughs> can acquire HIV um, just as well. And from a clinical point of view, we have to have HIV in almost every differential that we're dealing when we're dealing with clinical population. And it's all a reflection of, of this change in, 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 in an aging population. So what's our initial approach then to the identification of HIV uh, infection? So the first ca contact <coughs> um, it may involve counseling and screening. Um, then we have the issue of the, uh, the laboratory um, uh, testing, uh, con confidentiality in the, in the testing itself and having to explain the, the results to, to an individual who has uh, sought testing. These results need to be reported back and arrangements need to be made for long-term care if the individual is infected. Now in Washington State, um, we require by law a client-centered approach to both pre- and post-test um, HIV counseling. And the elements of this counseling include uh, an individual risk assessment and um, realistically trying to look at behavioral change to either prevent acquisition or prevent transmission of, um, of HIV. And uh, this takes time. Uh, anything involving behavioral change um, is fraught with difficulty. Um, and the major one is, is having sufficient time uh, and skills to, to bring this about. Now, a recent amendment to the Washington State Code is, has um, embraced the concept of opting out. And that is HIV testing that will be put into all consent forms uh, I I for people entering medical care, either at clinic or in the hospital. And they will be tested unless they specifically say they don't want to be tested. And this is part of a, a national approach to try to uh, identify the uh, quarter of the infected population that don't know they're infected because they've never been tested. Um, and it's estimated there's probably about 250,000 or more individuals <coughs> in that category. So um, th 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 although that was, was uh, put forth uh, several years ago, it takes time for uh, legislatures to bring about the um, lawful change in approach to testing. But this is now in our books, and uh, so opt out, and it may be in, in other states as well. And there are some additional slides in the handout that go into that. Now, with regard to pregnancy and delivery, the CDC recommends routine rapid HIV testing um, in this opt out approach. It was actually put forward in 2003, now embraced by our state. You need to Im inform the patient that, um, uh, so here we have a pregnant mom, uh, woman who who's presents for labor and delivery, has had no prior prenatal care, which is fairly common. And um, you need to assess whether she's infected because if she is HIV infected, um, there's medical management uh, ch uh, issues that are, that are involved, and that is putting her on um, prophylaxis while you're treating her, but you're putting her on antiviral therapy um, at the time of uh, delivery and then prophylaxing the baby uh, for a period of time after delivery. So a preliminary, and, and they, they say paused, but we really mean a reactive test, um, means that she may be infected, um, but it has to be confirmed, and it'll probably be confirmed after delivery. So a reactive test in such a mother uh, presenting for delivery would result in her being treated. Um, if it's false positive, not confirmed, that's fine. It will have even done no harm. But um, if it is in true, uh, a true, a true, true infection, then you have um, decreased the risk of transmission from somewhere around 20 to 30 percent down to maybe under a percent. Um, it could also have implications with regard to C-section as well. So if the rapid test is reactive in the labor and delivery, then she's offered antiretroviral therapy um, and the newborn is prophylaxed, and you, you'll get a confirmatory result back from the lab in, in a day or so. Now, the, why the conf confirmation? Well, <coughs> these screening tests are san very sensitive, but um, there's always a specificity issue, which is acceptable for a screening test. So the positive predictive value of any of these re um, uh, uh, point-of-care tests is dependent on the seroprevalence of the population you're testing. The higher the seroprevalence, the lower the false positive rate, the higher the true positive rate is of the test. And that's just an inherent nature. 
uh, of, of, of these assays, and, but why we have to do confirmatory testing. Because remember, our overall seroprevalence uh, in the U.S. population is about 0.6%. Uh, percent. In other countries that you come from, it's much higher. <coughs> if you're in Washington, D.C., obviously with a seroprevalence of 3%, the chance of that reactive test being a false positive is very, very small. So it changes as, as, you, as you move in and out of these uh, higher risk populations. So uh, let's look at the course of HIV infection, um, a few comments about early infection and established infection. So here's a case. Um, this is a 26-year-old African-American bisexual man who presents with a one-week history of fever uh, swollen lymph nodes and a headache, some photophobia. He had had unprotected sex with a new male partner three weeks prior to presenting to you. And on examination, he's got a red inflamed um, oral pharynx, he's got enlarged cervical lymph nodes, and he's got a splotchy rash um, over his body. So the question is, could this person be HIV infected? <coughs> now, there's a good chance that he would be diagnosed with something else, um, possibly infectious mono or something like that. Um, but in, in point of fact, any sexually active person, and, and a person like this that is admitted to having uh, sex with both men and women, um, is at high risk for HIV. And uh, the first thing on your differential is, in fact, HIV, not Epstein-Barr virus infection or infectious mono, although it could be that. Um, if you don't um, think of it, you won't test for it. And, and this is a real issue among uh, educating healthcare providers to always be thinking about HIV in individuals who are presenting um, with similar scenarios. So how might we diagnose um, uh, this individual? Now, he's been infected potentially for three weeks. So Will he have antibody? Maybe, but maybe not. It's pretty early. It generally takes a month, 20 days to 30 days, to get an antibody response. So a rapid, simple rapid test might be negative. Okay? So don't, don't because it's a simple rapid test, which you do right there, and the clinic is negative, don't rule out HIV. This is a typical scenario for primary infection. So what might you do? You, you've just given him his negative result. Who wants to send him home with no further discussion? Nobody, right? You want to spend some time talking to him, okay? And say, hey, you know, maybe this is HIV infection. It's maybe too early. We can order a test today, but uh, once you guys have developed the point of care rapid test for HIV RNA, of course, you'll be able to do that right there too, right? And be able to confirm infection. And I bet you we'll be able to do that in the next two or three years. But right now, you'd order an HIV test, okay? Send off the lab and say, you know, you got to behave like this maybe is really a true infection. High risk group, these are all symptoms compatible with HIV. You probably have high levels in your genital fluid and your semen. And there's a very good chance you can transmit the virus if anyone comes in contact with either your blood or your, or, or your semen. So, so um, you recommend that they abstain, <coughs> they come back, back for repeat testing. Now, the beauty of this point of care, simple rapid test, is you've already engaged him in discussion around a positive test result. Pretty powerful. Older data showed that 70% of such people never come back. If you just did the, drew the blood, sent them off, so come back in two weeks, and we'll discuss the result. Most people in, in such a situation would not come back. But now you've engaged him in this. Um, chances are he, he, this isn't new to him. He's thought about this before, but uh, this is the start. And um, uh, if we could confirm RNA, because he may not have antibody, it's too early, then if we detected RNA, we would actually have the diagnosis. So we have to now have a presumptive diagnosis of HIV infection. That's your working diagnosis, a presumptive diagnosis. And you behave um, accordingly and uh, uh, link him up, uh, start the linkage process with care, because if you're seeing him in a clinic or an emergency department, um, he needs to be linked into care. So uh, the, the standard ways of diagnosing infection then are, are the enzyme immunoassay uh, with confirmatory immunoblot or immunofluorescence antigen detection, 
What we actually do here is when we get a reactive EIA, we immediately do a, a point of care test called the multi-spot, which tells us if it's HIV-1 or HIV-2. We know that result right away <coughs> and inform the clinician that we have a presumptive positive or presumptive, uh, or, um, uh, uh, presumptive negative because uh, the reactive ELISA will go to Western blot. Um, we look for viral nucleic acid. We can either look for the integrated provirus in the cells. <coughs> this is an important component of pediatric diagnosis in the neonate. Uh, we look for RNA in the plasma, um, which is viral genomic RNA. And it's a very sensitive way of, of picking up virus in someone who's not being treated. Um, obviously, if you're on antiviral therapy, you could have the virus suppressed, be RNA negative, <coughs> but have the antibody to infection or the presence of DNA in the cells. And then we can look at the CD4 count as well, which is used uh, clinically. So the, <coughs> the diagnostic targets then for HIV involve um, uh, the infectious virus itself, which we no longer do outside of a research setting. We can look for bio P24 antigen in the blood. Uh, generally, we'll only see that um, generally early in infection <coughs> before there's sufficient antibody to neutralize it all. But it's, uh, antigen is now going to be an important component of detection, um, uh, used for detection of early infection with the FDA approval <coughs> of the Abbott uh, P24 antigen uh, antibody assay on the Architect pro, uh, 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 platform. We can look for our viral RNA itself uh, in the virus particle in the plasma. <coughs> um, we can look for viral DNA that's integrated in the host cell. There are other moieties that can be looked at but uh, are for research purposes. And then we look for antibodies. And remember, antibodies, the immune system is a natural amplification uh, uh, system in, in its own right. It just takes about 20 to 30 days for antibody to be detected. So anytime you suspect acute HIV infection based on the history and the clinical presentation, um, don't be surprised if the antibody test is, is uh, not reactive at that time. Uh, but repeat testing will show the rise in antibody. And there are <coughs> other tests, as we mentioned, either antigen or, or RNA that can be done um, to look for confirm confirmation of, of, of acute uh, early infection. With regard to the Western blot, which is the standard way of confirming a reactive ELISA, we look for antibodies against two of the following three viral proteins, either P24, the core protein here, um, GP41, which is a transmembrane glycoprotein here, or antibodies against the, the GP16120, which is the external um, precursor and, and, uh, and active um, uh, protein that, that attaches to the CD4 receptor and, C and chemokine receptor. So two of the antibodies, two of those three antibodies is a confirmatory Western blot. Clearly this pattern evolves over time and is, is, is sort of the, are the last sort of immunologic markers that, we, that, are, that, are, that, are, that are picked up. Uh, what makes the ELISA assays particularly sensitive is they, they look for both IgM and IgG antibody. Um, and when we look at a, a cartoon then of, of, um, of early infection, um, there's exposure. Uh, in generally within several days or a week or so, um, there's viremia. Um, and then once viremia is detected in the plasma, um, uh, within about 20 days or so, we'll have antibody. <coughs> the RNA is detected within... Uh, three to five days, and then rises very rapidly. Antigen a few days later, detection of DNA a few days later, um, and, then, and then the antibodies by day 20. So there's a seronegative window in here when there's clear evidence of viral replication as shown by high levels of viral RNA, but no antibody. In the case that I uh, presented to you a few moments ago is an individual who's in this window period where there are antibody negative but RNA is present. Uh, at high levels, and maybe in the millions of copies, uh, and we won't see this, the establishment of the set point um, until a, a, around 100 or so days after infection, so about three months or so. So this window period is extremely important, and where a lot of people are missed um, or misdiagnosed, but the tools are here to, to, to do that, and uh, importantly, in the next few years, uh, we will probably have point of care quantitative RNA assays to help close this window down even more. The introduction of the, of the Abbott P24 antigen um, EIA assay for antibody and antigen will also be reactive in here if it is picking up antigen. Generally, we pick up antigen if the RNA level is over 10,000 copies. 
below that, it's not sensitive enough. But these people uh, who are acutely infected invariably have extremely high levels of virus during this time. So we would <laughs> anticipate um, most would be picked up, but not all, uh, when we look at RNA. Another way from a public health point of view, uh, perspective, that we look for these early infections is many um, <coughs> public health programs pool um, uh <coughs> seronegative plasma or serum uh, and, and then test these pools for viral RNA. Because the levels are so high, you can combine uh, generally around 30 uh, uh, patients together and then test that combined pool for RNA. And if it's reactive, or you detect RNA, the pool can be broken apart and you can identify the uh, infected individual. And we do this in my lab for the public health department here and are able to turn uh, these around in a, in a couple of days or so. So uh, it's still experimental in a sense that, that um, we have to be able to prove that identifying these individuals that early um, does affect a change in management, that these individuals are identified, and from a research point of view, their sexual networks identified and to find out what's the best way to approach um, a blocking transmission. Because as I mentioned, we think that maybe up to half or so of acute infections, uh, of, of infections occur during this acute infection period when people are viremic and don't know that they're infected and are still, um, <coughs> still have their sexual networks in place. So simple rapid testing. Um, with the revised guidelines from CDC uh, for increased screening um, in, in the United States, um, this is the impetus for having simple rapid testing so one can do point of care <coughs> uh, screening uh, to identify the quarter million or so people who are uh, infected but don't <coughs> know it. Um, so that's a requirement from a point of care antibody screening. <coughs> the guidelines at the moment don't include um, laboratory screening for acute infection, uh, but I have mentioned that to you, and we'll see probably changes in that, that, that approach with nucleic acid testing um, becoming more prevalent uh, in, in the near future. Um, there are several um, <coughs> antibody uh, testing technologies that have been approved by the FDA for looking at, at virus and blood, serum, plasma, etc. Um, the advantage of not going for blood is that you're able to, um, to have a, <coughs> a more um, uh, a friendly collection procedure for, for patients. They much rather provide saliva than blood. Um, it's also safer for healthcare providers not to be using needles. It decreases the risk of percutaneous exposure. Um, uh, as I've mentioned, to provide a rapid test result during that single visit, um, be the test negative or positive or reactive, um, allows you to engage in the conversation about either preventing transmission or, or acquiring transmission for the first time. And it's believed that that then um, uh, enables the, the, the uh, patient to, um, that facilitates them coming back for further counseling and, and testing. Um, and clearly, point-of-care tests are, are, are more convenient all around um, because they can be done outside of laboratory testing, can be done in clinics, can be done wherever you want, wherever the, wherever the people are um, to be tested. In general, I'm not going into in great detail in these tests because it's going to come up in, in some of your future lectures. But there are six FDA-approved simple rapid um, point-of-care type tests in the United States. The Oroquick um, and the Unigold are the two that are approved for, for actual point-of-care use. The others, uh, which include the uh, Reveal um, uh, test, the multi-spot, which we use in our lab, <laughs> and the Clearview um, tests are considered to be of moderate complexity and therefore done in a laboratory setting. But even having a rapid test in a laboratory setting is useful because, as I mentioned, what we do is combine our standard EIA, EIA screening um, with a uh, point of care presumptive confirmation right away and let the, the, ph the physician ordering a health care provider know that day that they have a reactive ELISA that is presumptively, presumptively confirmed by the multi-spot um, and that they can engage <coughs> um, their, their patient with that information while we await uh, Western Blot confirmation, which takes another day or so in our facility. But you'll hear more about the test designs and, and the like. Uh, these lateral flow assays are all pretty popular, um, relatively easy to read. But I, I do want to stress that, <coughs> that um, you still need to do uh, quality assurance with these. Um, 
uh, in general, non-laboratory trained individuals are running them, so they're running clinics, and lots of things go on in clinics besides testing. Right? They're busy clinics, there's all sorts of issues going on, and it's very difficult for uh, busy clinic uh, personnel to set aside a 10 minute period of time to do the testing. Um, so there are limitations and there are misinterpretations that do, do go on, but generally it, it's probably our best approach to um, this whole issue. So the, the advantages then of the simple rapid tests are to increase res the receipt of test results um, uh, to identify uh, HIV-infected pregnant women so that they can receive effective prof prophylaxis at the time of labor and delivery if they haven't had any um, prior uh, prenatal care, uh, which is fairly common um, in, in, uh, here and around the world. Um, the ability to, to produce the same day results, of course, is, is advantageous. Um, this increases the number of venues where testing can be offered. Um, so you go to the, to the individuals you want to screen, they don't have to come to you. That's always a good, a good approach. The downside is that in low seroprevalent populations, you are going to generate false positive results, but that's fine. Um, that's the nature of this type of screening, and, and that needs to be explained. In general, simple rapid tests are not efficient for large numbers of specimens. Um, if you don't have the time constraint, then screening is, uh, by, by uh, uh, EIA is, is more cost effective because you run larger batches of samples through at any given time. Um, quality assurance is, is required. Operator errors are, uh, can be an issue uh, in the non-laboratory setting. And so I think that some of the most compelling reasons then for simple rapid tests uh, in this country are to test women um, at the time of labor and delivery. Um, these are some data that were published showing point of care testing in the labor and delivery room versus sending it to the laboratory. You can see the increased turnaround time because medical decisions are made on this. If the, if the woman is, is reactive on the point of care test, she'll be given prophylaxis uh, for HIV um, because confirmation done by the lab isn't going to appear for another day or so. So it's extremely important. Uh, and then identifying unrecognized asymptomatic HIV infection uh, in a timely way that provides access to further counseling um, for those individuals is also a strong rationale and uh, why this, this whole area is, is um, um, blossoming. We now need to take it to the next level, which is point of care confirmatory testing so that uh, one stop shopping in that one visit, you can actually uh, have an answer and be able to direct the individual to the appropriate um, care facility for further follow-up uh, and uh, uh, counseling and, and possibly uh, treatment if it's uh, indicated. In the, diag the diagnosis of HIV infection, neonate um, does pose some challenges because, not surprisingly, uh, you know, antibody is, is passed across the placenta from the mother to the baby. So uh, an HIV-infected mother delivers a HIV seropositive infant, right? But that doesn't mean the infant is infected. So you can't rely on antibody tests to diagnose uh, the, the infection in the neonate because this antibody is maternal and it may take up to a year or more to clear. So uh, <coughs> what can you do? If, if the baby's infected in utero, there might be virus there at the time of delivery. If the baby's infected at the time of parturition, you may not detect any virus because it just hasn't had time to replicate. So, and there's going to be antibody there. So you're going to look for virus, but you may take a couple of tests to find it. Okay, um, the majority will detect at the time of delivery if they're viremic, but they may have to be tested again. Um, and certainly within the first month or so following uh, delivery, we're able to detect all infections uh, based on nucleic acid testing. But, you, uh, you know, but that's an issue. Um, uh, fortunately, mums return for prenatal, uh, postnatal care, um, and, and that's an opportunity for repeat testing. So in general, RNA is, is more sensitive than DNA, um, although the majority of um, neonatal infections are picked up by looking for cell-associated DNA. The one manufacturer of this test, uh, is Roche, is going to be probably stopping it uh, in the near future, and others are stepping in to provide that service. The one uh, issue with HIV RNA is if the mother's on antiviral therapy 
and the baby has antiviral drugs on board, the virus could be there, but you wouldn't detect it because uh, it's suppressed. Uh, and that might be one area where RNA isn't as sensitive as DNA. So we'll probably need both DNA and RNA <coughs> for neonatal diagnosis uh, for the foreseeable future anyway. Um, there are other laboratory tests that are, that are, that are done, which I, I'm only going to mention. Um, genotyping is important <coughs> um, for detecting uh, uh, drug resistance. Um, that's not a point of care test, that's a sequencing assay of the viral genome. We can also um, determine the phenotype of the virus, um, and that is whether <coughs> um, it's a R5 or X4 virus. Uh, but again, that's an uh, expensive and time-consuming assay. Um, we can also uh, look for the chemokine uh, utilization of the virus, which is important uh, perhaps for the use of some of the um, uh, CCR5 um, blocking drugs. But these are all other tests that are done at a laboratory, laboratory level but don't involve point of care. And so we won't really say much more about them. Other than the complexities of HIV monitoring um, go from from almost the simple, like measuring antibody, all the way through to sequencing the viral genome. All now here in this country is part of routine care and an important part of clinical trials internationally as well. Um, but that's not generally um, accessed by, by the healthcare systems. So what are the principles of primary care uh, laboratory monitoring and the impact uh, of treatment? So um, We'll look at established infection. Um, we'll look at issues of primary prophylaxis for opportunistic infections, um, and antiviral therapy, uh, and disease and therapy monitoring, and then touch on some issues of um, uh, primary health care maintenance and, and, and post pre and post exposure prophylaxis. Now, the classification of HIV infection, there's an old and a new method. Um, <coughs> um, up until recently, we classified individuals. Uh, clinically, whether they were asymptomatic or symptomatic or had an opportunistic, uh, AIDS-defining opportunistic infection or malignancy. And then we looked at the CD4 count, uh, high CD4 count over 500, all the way through to individuals under 200. The new classification is simply based on the CD4 count. And you're either stage 1 uh, if your CD4 count's over 500, stage 2 if it's between 200 and 500, or have an AIDS-defining stage 3 if you're under 200. And the other way to have an AIDS-defining stage 3 is to have an opportunistic infection or malignancy. So the symptomatic, asymptomatic component, which, which really crept in because it, it was important early on, um, that hasn't c uh, carried through. We also don't look at RNA uh, in this classification. So if you're discussing uh, a patient now, your stage 1 if your CD4 counts over 500, stage 2 if it's between 200 and 500, and uh, stage 3 if you're under 200 or have a an infection or malignancy that qualifies you as AIDS. And that's the current way that you, you characterize um, patients to your colleagues. Um, <coughs> the CD4 count is associated with survival. These are data from the MAX study, which was a large cohort um, established uh, uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s. And um, basically, it, it followed survival based on what the CD4 RNA levels were at the time of entry. And um, you can see here that individuals with a CD4 count of under 300 at the time they entered that study prior to therapy had a median survival of about six years. Um, and individuals with, with, um, with CD4 counts above that, I don't know why this is jumping around so much, sorry, um, um, had a median survival of about 10 years. As it turns out, our, our target now for therapy is to treat everyone with a CD4 count at 350 uh, as, as our, as our um, uh, stratification. Um, for RNA, um, again in the MAX cohort, individuals with RNA levels of over 36,000 RNA copies per mil in this upper quartile <laughs> had a median time to progression to sur of surviving of about uh, between five and six years. Individuals with viral levels of under 5,000 um, hadn't even reached the median survival. It, the, sur the over sev about 70 percent or so were surviving over 10 years. So again, just to show the relationship between the level of viral replication and the CD4 count, and how important they are in establishing progno prognosis, and, and we use that information when we're first looking at subjects. The controversy now that that's evolving is about really when to start therapy. Um, as I mentioned. Um, 
m most of us feel <coughs> comfortable starting at 350 CD4 cells. There are some longitudinal or observational data suggesting that the earlier you start, the better, but that has to be balanced against the benefits, um, cost benefits of, of um, putting people on lifelong therapy um, too early. Um, there is obviously a public health imperative, and that is the earlier you treat people and you, and you show that you can decrease a general shedding of virus, then in theory you should be able to decrease transmission in a population. And these are all studies that are being looked at. Um, to provide some quantitative data <coughs> outside of observational studies to, to, uh, to, to arrive at, at the, the decision. Obviously, the earlier you treat, the, the more cost there is as well, uh, not only to the individual, but the whole issue of access to therapy programs like this. Um, so those are, those are ongoing considerations. So when to start um, and what to start with? Well. <coughs> At the moment, our, our treatment is directed at viral-specific targets uh, for the most part. And that's at entry of the virus to the cell, um, uh, reverse transcriptase, um, uh, drugs that block reverse transcriptase, transcriptase uh, integrase, which integrates the viral genome into, the, into to the, uh, the viral DNA copy of the genome into the host DNA, and protease uh, enzyme blockers that interfere with um, the processing of the virus, viral proteins. And our objective from a therapeutic point of view is to suppress the virus to as low as possible, which generally is below our limit of detection, uh, which is less than 50 copies per mil. That doesn't mean the virus has gone away. It just means it's, we can't measure it uh, at that level <coughs> um, and maintain that suppression for as long as possible. Um, and the other challenge, of course, is, is to have sustained adherence. Uh, and you probably need uh, drug adherence uh, of over 90 percent to be effective. And committing people to lifelong therapy with multiple drugs is a real challenge. And fortunately, we're able to start, start most patients on a single pill a day. You know, uh, it contains three drugs, but a single pill a day is pretty good. It'd be nice maybe if you could take a pill once a week or a pill once a month, and maybe we'll be there someday too um, to make it uh, to make uh, adherence better. Because the the consequence of poor adherence, uh, sporadic treatment, is development of drug resistance. It's not that we don't have other drugs you can use, it just becomes more complicated. And it'd be nice if you could have a first-line drug that's successful for the remaining portion of the patient's life. So the optimal time to start therapy is, is really unknown, although there are opinions about that. Um, we know for sure that uh, once you start therapy, you stay on therapy. Starting and stopping is not safe. Um, disease progresses. Uh, and uh, we don't uh, believe in intermittent therapy anymore based on strong clinical trials data. Um, treatment guidelines um, uh, currently that uh, rely on observational uh, cohort studies to push that 350 CD4 count up to higher, to 500 or more. Uh, and there were two publications in the last year, or a year ago. One, the Accord study, and then a study in the published in the Lancet uh, from large cohorts. That generally arrived at the conclusion it's, it's certainly best to start at 350 or above, um, but what that above level is, uh, is isn't well defined. Um, although the standard, standard of practice now is, it <coughs> is, is here in, in this country, in the resource um, rich parts of the world, is 350 CD4 cells. Uh, in many uh, resource limited settings, um, you know, under 200 is, is the target. Although it's interesting, if you look at people in this country who start therapy, <coughs> um, who, who are newly diagnosed, I think the average CD4 counts around 180. So there's a whole cohort of individuals that, for whatever reason, um, don't come to medical attention until they're actually quite advanced, um, uh, and under 200 uh, before they're started on therapy. So it's not all that different from, from what's going on in resource-limited parts of the world. WHO, you know, has comments on this, and uh, and uh, these are changing all the time. So, if we look at therapy, and I try to capsulize therapy on a single slide, there are other slides in your set, but this is the one we'll look at. Um, if we, we we there are drugs that are designed to block the entry of the virus, um, and this is to to block the attachment of the virus to the chemokine receptor, and there's a licensed drug that does this. Uh, studies to look at soluble CD4 and other ways of blocking the CD4 interaction um, are experimental 
and nothing is in clinical use at the moment. But there is a drug, uh, Maraviroc, that blocks uh, attachment to the CCR5 chemokine receptor. There are fusion inhibitors that block the uh, fusion of the viral envelope with the cell plasma membrane uh, and interacts with the <coughs> uh, functioning of uh, GP41. Uh, Fusion or infervitide is the drug. Uh, we can block um, the reverse transcriptase using nucleoside or nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors. There are several in the, in, uh, uh, available. Um, the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, these are drugs that, that bind to part of the, uh, uh, to the enzyme outside of the active pocket, uh, enzyme pocket, and prevent uh, uh, the enzyme from functioning. Uh, integrase inhibitors um, <coughs> prevent uh, the, the viral uh, DNA, the copy of the viral RNA uh, from integrating into the host genome, uh, and these are very effective. There's one, and there'll be more in the near future. And then the protease inhibitors uh, interfere with the processing of viral proteins and prevent maturation of the viral particle once it's left uh, budded from the cell, uh, and these have, have really <laughs> made a big difference in um, the response to therapy and the types of outcomes that we're now experiencing with HIV. So in a nutshell, this is a summary. I've listed uh, in your handout uh, the, the drugs that are licenses of June uh, of this year, um, and there'll probably be some more in the, in the upcoming year or so. So the goals of therapy then are to increase the CD4 count to over 200 by suppressing virus um, and maintaining viral levels as low as possible for as long as possible. Uh, doing so um, results in improved quality of life. There's no, there's no question uh, about that. But this doesn't happen in all patients. And in many clinics, we may <laughs> see 40% uh, or more patients that do don't uh, achieve that level of suppression uh, for various reasons. And we spend a lot of time uh, looking at compliance, um, trying to determine whether the, vi the virus is resistant to the therapy they're on, switching therapies, et cetera. Uh, and remember, this is done in the context of a lot of other issues in these patients' lives. Um, uh, and HIV may not be their top priority, it is yours in the clinic, but there are other issues that need to be dealt with. In trying to achieve um, really good compliance and adherence um, involves many other um, members of the healthcare team, and in particular social workers and the like, to address the various vicissitudes of life that, that uh, can interfere with, um, with adherence to therapy. So what about the prognosis? Well, initially, survival of women uh, was thought to be lower than men, but really um, that was probably due to decreased access to care at that time. And right now, we have no gender differences uh, in survival between men and women. Um, effective antiretroviral therapy will result in a decreased mortality uh, from, uh, from uh, AIDS and uh, uh, prevents the, the development of AIDS in people who are HIV infected. There's no question, when you look at the statistics and we look at the earlier epochs, this is um, cumulative uh, mortality from AIDS. We can see that, that in the early parts of the epidemic, uh, between the mid-80s and, and uh, 1990, uh, in that range, um, that the median uh, survival was about a year after a diagnosis of AIDS. Now the median survival is about 16 years after the diagnosis of AIDS down here with these antiviral drugs. And in fact, survival is, is improved remarkably. So um, it, it doesn't cure people, um, but it puts the disease into sort of a state of remission, if you like, um, that improves quality of life and allows uh, individuals to live a long time. I'm, I'm not convinced that, that individuals who are HIV infected and on therapy live as long uh, there's a, other data to show that the long-term survival is so somewhat less, but um, we're approaching that that uh, that goal of turning it into a, a chronic treated uh, uh, disease, um, with I would say pretty good success given where we were back in the um, in the uh, 1980s and early 1990s, before the combination therapies <coughs> uh, were available, in particular with the introduction of protease inhibitors. In the, in the mid uh, 90s, 96, 97, in that era. So now we're faced with the issue that, that um, people are living a long time and now coming down with other diseases. As I, as I mentioned, the median um, age in my clinic is about 46 years. Um, 
And so we deal a lot with cardiovascular disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, the ravages of diabetes, et cetera, et cetera, and aging. And there are clearly um, impacts on overall health due to HIV and the drugs in the way of changes in bone mineral density and, and the like. We still have issues of ongoing dementia um, due to HIV infection in the central nervous system uh, that need to be dealt with as well. But our HIV clinics now are turning more and more into general medicine clinics. And over the next 10, 20 years, we'll be evolving into geriatric clinics uh, as well. And so that's something to keep in mind. However, um, when we look at the developing world, only a fraction of the people who should be on therapy are on therapy. <coughs> um, there are major issues coming up with the capping, uh, capitation of, um, of, uh, of, of monies to support antiretroviral therapy. And the vast majority of people in the developing world are not going to have access to therapy, uh, the way things are looking at the moment. <coughs> um, and this is most unfortunate. And, and we, I'm not going to go into it, but it's uh, a political disaster. Um, Immune-based therapies are not available. Um, results have been disappointing. Vaginal microbicides to empower women <coughs> to protect themselves are equally disappointing, and nothing's really available. And vaccines, of course, are not available. Our only line of defense at the moment is uh, safe sexual practices, uh, education, and uh, probably the use of antiviral viral drugs to prevent transmission. Uh, these others are a long way off and seem to be getting farther away by the day. Um, so as I mentioned, HIV-infected people are now at risk of the various non-AIDS-defining malignancies, including anal carcinoma, vaginal uh, uh, cervical cancer, um, Hodgkin's lymphomas, cancers of the liver, lung, melanomas, oropharyngeal carcinomas, leukemias, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and these are things that we're, we're, we're carefully looking for and trying to treat. One of the big uh, issues uh, in, in overall health is smoking cessation. Um, we devote a lot of time in my clinic to trying to get our patients to come off cigarettes, but it's very difficult because of the uh, nicotine addiction. The issue of reducing HPV infection is a global issue because we have a vaccine that can prevent HPV infection in women. As you know, in the developing world, the number one malignancy killing women is cervical cancer. And it's preventable, totally preventable, with one of the best vaccines ever. So how do we get that out in the face of uh, current um, constraints <coughs> that the developing world is, is um, undergoing? So cancer screening strategies are extremely important and have, have a huge role internationally. So what about prevention? Well, based on our knowledge of transmission, obviously screening blood products, um, safe sexual practices, uh, avoid sharing of contaminated needles, uh, controlling injection drug use, and providing clean needles um, in those populations. Uh, any retroviral therapy of in, uh, pregnant uh, women and, um, to avoid uh, to prevent maternal child transmission. Uh, breastfeeding is uh, a difficult issue. Um, Easy to proscribe here, difficult to, to do that in resource limited settings where breastfeeding is absolutely uh, essential for nutrition of the infant and to prevent them from dying uh, without it. Vaginal microbicides are not available um, and probably won't be uh, uh, that successful. Uh, at least haven't seen data that says they will be, and vaccines aren't available. So again, we're, we're limited to, so, uh, to social behavioral interventions and, and, and using antiretroviral drugs to block transmission where one can get access to these. And that's a very difficult issue uh, at the moment. With regard to healthcare workers, uh, post-exposure prophylaxis uh, in the occupational setting, uh, very, uh, very efficacious <coughs> with at least an 80% reduction or more um, by in, in transmission. Uh, following uh, percutaneous exposure, uh, providing prophylaxis is provided. The earlier data was with a single drug, as you know. As you know, we use multiple drugs, two or three, um, and, uh, and this is very successful. But again, relies on having rapid access to these drugs uh, in the healthcare setting. Non-occupational um, uh, exposures uh, where we have sexual assault, uh, 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 
uh, et cetera, needle stick injuries. Um, there are guidelines put out by CDC. Um, there's really no data available yet to, uh, to show that it works, but it's provided uh, generally. And uh, if exposure has been within 72 hours, uh, uh, post-exposure prophylaxis may be prescribed. Uh, more than 72 hours, it's not. The issue always is getting people to take these drugs for 28 days. Um, in the healthcare setting, probably half of our uh, employees we start on therapy uh, don't go beyond two weeks because of side effects. And these drugs are known to have side effects, and you're, they're being given to people who are otherwise healthy. They may be perturbed because they've had an exposure, um, but they're otherwise healthy. And so the tolerability is low. Um, in the, the non-occupational setting where you have less control, less follow-up, um, uh, who knows how the drugs are really being used or how they're being tolerated. It's worthwhile to pause for a moment and look at the risks of acquisition. And this table's uh, useful because it, it summarizes um, some of these numbers for us. This is based, these data are based on a blood transfusion exposure where the chance of transmitting is about 9,000 out of 10,000 exposures. So 90% uh, transmission rate. And if we look at other, uh, other uh, ways of transmitting the virus, receptive uh, penile, vaginal intercourse, and insertive penile, we can see that the receptive partner is at higher risk by about twofold than the, um, than the insertive partner. When we look at insertive anal sex versus receptive anal sex, we can see a ratio of about, um, uh, again, over about tenfold with the receptive partner being at higher risk than the insertive partner. And then receptive oral uh, and insertive oral intercourse, very low risks. Not, this is the Bill Clinton uh, approach to safe sexual practices. Um, and uh, it, it sort of works, but the numbers are, are low. But um, oral genital contact is very common, um, and, but still poses a risk uh, to, for, for acquisition and transmission. The non-exposure um, uh, guidelines are summarized here for you um, in, your, in your handout. And uh, basically, it's if you're under 72 hours, it may be offered, providing um, the risk is stratified uh, and considered high enough. If it's over 72 hours, there's no uh, prophylaxis recommended. But this is going to be very difficult to prove whether it works or not, but is, is generally available in most emergency departments <coughs> around the country. So in summary, um, from the epidemiology point of view, there's a huge epidemic among black Americans that is underappreciated. Um, and tragic. <coughs> uh, counseling and screening, the opt-out is being accepted um, across the country uh, and is the most rational way of offering of screening. But if you're going to screen people, they have to be offered access to health care, right? You can't just screen and not do anything. Um, uh, so that, that, that's an important issue. Uh, and the object here is to identify the quarter million or more people who are infected but don't know it. Um, we can define uh, acute early uh, infection uh, by looking at RNA uh, uh, detection. Uh, and uh, point of care plays an extremely important role. Point of care testing plays an extremely important role in helping to identify uh, antibody positive individuals. Um, the principles of, of primary care uh, in monitoring uh, of the disease um, is to uh, provide. Um, uh, and promote uh, adherence to therapy. Um, uh, we have to be able to provide the social and mental health support for treatment of a chronic disease, um, but it's still fatal. Um, and uh, with time, as we see an aging population who are HIV infected, we will have to deal with these other uh, concurrent uh, infections and, um, and malignancies that are gonna, going to creep into to routine health care. And then and my final comment is that women globally carry a disproportionate burden of HIV infection, um, and, uh, and this deserves our, our attention over the next uh, decade.